going live. Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we're talking about pinch rods. Um, in particular, we're going to be talking about the history of measurement because uh, apparently this is something that is a little bit uh, confusing to some people. Uh, I did a video earlier this week making this set of pinch rods and I thought I made the assumption that pinch rods were a very well-known topic and everyone kind of understood it and understood why this one was um, different and, and fun. Uh, but apparently I was wrong and uh, not everyone understands why one is fun and the other is traditional or what even are pinch rods. Um, so we've got some things to talk about. Um, that being said, there isn't too much coming on the calendar. Um, other than the next uh, MWTCA meet is in June, um, and I'm hoping to be at that one that's in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, still haven't fully made plans for that. Um, would love to find someone I could meet up with in uh, Baltimore and ride up. But uh, So if you're looking for someone to ride with and, and split a, a hotel room for the, the trip, let me know. Um, but other than that, we're, uh, is there anything else going on right now? I think we're, we've gotten through the busy season with tools. Um, I just got back from a trip out to Ohio. Uh, I went to Colonial Homestead, so if you didn't see that, I put out a video showing uh, Colonial Homestead is a store devoted to hand tools. There's about six or seven stores like that in the whole United States. Um, and so any chance I get to go to that, it was, it was just a lot of fun. We spent a whole day there um, showing the store and what was in it. And tomorrow's video will actually be a really, really cool chest of tools. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, but yeah actually got to hang out with, uh, with Rex Kruger uh, for a few hours on, on Sunday, so that was a, a good trip. But it's good to be back, so let's do some talking here. You know, the, As opposed to like <laughs> <laughs> um, waxing elephants. One of the things that, I, uh, that I've come across is uh, the understanding of the history of measurement. And until you really understand that, you're kind, of, um, you're, you're kind of putting yourself into a box that is hard to get out of. Um, and once you can understand a few basic things about it, there are a lot of other designs and concepts that suddenly become available to you. Uh, let me explain that. One of the things we think of now are inches or millimeters or whatever you use, there's a standard measurement and an inch is an inch no matter where you are in the world. A millimeter is still a millimeter here, whether you're in Europe or wherever you go, they're, they're, they're standard things. Um, and one of the things that that I first ran into this when I went to China, I actually bought a dress for my wife. And so she gave me all of her measurements. And so I gave the measurement to the dressmaker. And come to find out in China, they have inches and feet as well, but their inches are about an eighth of an inch longer than our inch. So they have nine eighths in an inch. <laughs> um, but their, their foot is also 12 inches, which is, you know, 12 eighths of an inch American. And um, it was kind of an odd thing to me that they had the exact same measurement and the terms, but they had slightly different measurements. And if you look at human history, that is something that it has been the way most of human history has been. Usually when you wanted to measure something, you didn't say it was so many inches, so many feet, so many millimeters, so many meters. Uh, you would say it's this many sticks long. And if it's, you know, three and a little more of this, then you would find out, you know, is it half of this stick or is it a quarter of this stick? And every shop had their own set of measurements. Now, yes, there was standardization in each particular country, and a lot of them had inches, and you'd go to another country, and they would also have inches, but they'd be slightly different because they're all measured off of the king's size or however that country measured it. But most of the time, when you went to a shop, that shop had specific tools that they used for measuring, and they didn't always correspond to whatever the standard was. They were just that stick. Uh, one of the things you would see, and I really want to get one of these, is you'd have a wheel. It would be a disc about this big and it would have an axle through it and a handle coming up, and you would roll the wheel along, and that wheel would be used to measure it. So a full rotation of the wheel would be you know, something around three feet, but each wheel diameter would change, and you could actually measure out large beams rolling the wheel around. And that wheel wasn't something that was very specific to a particular measurement type. It was just, that was the meal, wheel I made, and so therefore that's by the item by which I measure everything in my shop. The actual measurements don't matter. And still to this day, the actual measurements don't matter. The only time 
that knowing a specific measurement doesn't matter is when I can't hand you my stick. If I can hand you my stick and I say that it is three of these long, you can take my stick and you can measure out the exact same thing on your end. But if you're across the country, I can't give you my stick. What I can do is because we have standard measurement now, I can say it is 24 inches long. And you can pull out your tape measure and be relatively sure you're, when you cut a stick to that length, you can make it the same length. That's the only reason that standard measurements actually matter is when you have to transfer the information and you can't transfer reality. So that being said, pinch rods. Um, these are a little bit different. And this was when you wanted to find a measurement that was slightly more than one stick. So in this case, if I wanted to measure out my bench, I would start out over here and I'd go, okay, it's that one. And then I can move it over to here. So I've got two sticks long. And then I move it over here and my bench is, oh no, it's two and that much. Well, how much is that? So what I would do is take a knife and mark this. And then I can go and put that on another board and make that board the exact same length. It would be one, two, and a mark. And I could transfer it along. Well, if I need to do multiple measurements, then I'd put multiple marks across. And I might actually make uh, notes across on the stick to know what it is. And that's where a story stick comes out. A story stick may or may not be the entire measurement. It may be one or two full movements and then this much, or it may be the cross width of my bench, which is actually that much. Um, and so a story stick could be used for a project and you'd see a lot of antique shops that would have a story stick for a particular table that they made. And it would have all of the required measurements to make that table on a single stick. But what happens if you want your stick to be adjustable. Well, um, board stretchers hadn't been invented, so that's where these came in. Pinch rods work together, and this is a very, very traditional style, um, this one here, and this is one I actually just made today. Pinch rods allow you to have sticks that can change length. So if I need something to measure it, I can put this out there, and I can mark it down, and now I have something that's that length. And that's really cool because I can make this any particular length I want. I could make it this length, I can make it this length, I can make it that length. And I could get all of these measurements with one tool. How fascinating is that? Um, and well, here let me actually show you this. This is, oop, focus in. This is a very uh, traditional set of, of, of pinch rods. And uh, one of the things I found in that recent video is that um, a lot of people don't know what these are. And basically it's a box that comes around and it's attached to this bottom stick on this side. And on this one, it's attached to the top stick so that they can slide past each other. And then you have one screw that locks them down and now they can't move. And it used to be that every toolbox had a set of pinch rods or a couple sets of pinch rods. You'd have different lengths. Um, and this was just necessary. Nowadays we have tape measures. Um, and so we don't use these quite as much. But tape measures are a very, very new thing. Uh, the next step up from pinch rods is, okay, well, we now have standard measurements, and I actually put markings out on my pinch rod, so I know when I extend it and I lock it down, it is this stick plus whatever the markings are on the back. But what if I want to have more flexibility of this? Well, then I've got these things, which are really cool. These are actually pinch rods. And so this one slides out to here, and that one slides out, and that one slides out, and that one slides out, and they can continue on, and I can measure out any distance I want with these. And so it's a whole bunch of pinch rods connected together. Um, and this one's kind of cool because you have the markings on here, so I can actually measure out the full length along this. And so a lot of people think about this as a foldable tape measure. Well, in the time when this was produced, it was an extendable pinch rod. And rather than being a, a foldable tape measure because a tape measure wasn't something that really was. Then they moved into the folding rule and rather than having them slide past each other because that takes a lot of extra work, you just put a hinge on the end and now these can pivot out and you can do the exact same thing. The only downside to this 
is that you're locked to this measurement or this measurement. You can't do anything in between those. Some of these would actually have one slide rule on the last one so that you could do the in-between sizes, um, but most of them eventually just turned into the folding rule. Oh, excuse me, the, the um, this, well, folding rule isn't wrong, but there's a more technical term. Um, I can't remember it. This, this is a folding rule. A folding rule actually folds in half and then folds in half in 90 degrees. And so you would have your tape measure. And so these came out um, pretty close to in sequence. Oh, this one does have a pinch rod on there. Okay, cool. Yeah, let me show you this. This one does have, on the last one here, this one has this piece that slides out and allows me to measure other things in between lengths. Um, and so the transition is between stick and pinch rod and accurate measuring devices is you start to get into standardized measurement. And somewhere along this line, the actual measurement of this is five inches long became more important than it is this stick long. Um, and that, that's something that's kind of hard for us to understand and, and get around. Because when I'm working in the shop and I'm making something, I very, very rarely ever actually measure something unless I'm going off of plans. In other words, someone somewhere else is giving me information so that I can duplicate the measurement at a distance. Uh, most of the time, I'm going to use reality. I'm going to put a stick down here and mark it because that is going to be infinitely more accurate than going off of someone else's measurement because every time you transfer the information from one place to another, you lose accuracy and you're always getting slightly off. Whereas if you measure reality with a stick, you actually get a far more accurate mark. Um, any questions before I start? Or just the just one from Warren this morning. Right, this I'll, morning. I'll get that one a bit. <laughs> For later. Um, so nowadays, the question is, are pinch rods necessary? And in all honesty, you don't need them very often. There are very few places where this is the go-to tool, but there are a few places, and I'll show those in a minute. And the reason being is because nowadays we think in standardized measurements. And because of that, um, this has now replaced all of that. And it's kind of nice because this is a very convenient, useful thing. And you can use it for just measuring. This is 21 and 11 sixteenths. And that's a fairly accurate measurement. But in this case, it's within a sixteenth. Whereas if I put the stick on here and put a knife mark on it, that knife mark would be exactly on it, not within a sixteenth. So it kind of comes down to where do you need that to be. Um, but pinch rods do have a few uses, and there is a reason why these were found in every toolbox up until about a hundred years ago. Around the time that hand tools started disappearing, these started disappearing. And these are fantastic for measuring inside measurements. And the reason for that is if you're using a tape measure, if you want to measure from this wall to this wall, you then have to bend it. And you've got this radius here that just doesn't give you a very accurate measurement. Now, you, there are tape measures that have measurement to the back, and so you can measure up against something. And you can kind of get a good idea of it there, but you have to do math, this plus that, and it, it, it gets a little annoying. Um, the other thing is measuring from corner to corner. Um, you can kind of do that, but because this tape doesn't actually get into the corner, you're not going to be getting a very accurate measurement. And that's where pinch rods really, really shine, is finding out, is this box actually square? Well, normally what I would do is take a tape measure, and I'm going to put this in focus. I'm going to measure inside corner to inside corner, and it should be uh, 17 and a hair over a quarter. And then I go this way, 17 and a hair over a quarter, close to it. So yeah, according to this tape measure, it's fairly square. But this can get it even more accurate. And the reason being is that these points go right into the corner. So when I put this in, I can extend it out, and have it touch this corner, then lock it down. 
And now I can take it out and I can put it in here and I've got a lot of slop. And by measurement, that's probably off a little more than a sixteenth inch, but it becomes very, very obvious with pinch rods which one is square, uh, which, which corner is longer, so I can then change my box to match my pinch rods. And this allows you to square up things very, very quickly. Um, so on to some of the questions from the video. Well, let me, let me back up before, before I do that. So the reason that this was so cool to me was not that it was pinch rods. It's not that it was easy to use because you can do this exact same thing with any two sticks. I could grab a stick and a tape measure and I could put it in between things and mark off distance, get, you know, a paper clip or something like that, lock these together and there I've got pinch rods. They're just two sticks that slide against each other and have a way to lock down. It wasn't that I was making something easy or simple. I was actually trying to make something that was hard and difficult. I was trying to take a traditional stick and make it something really cool. And this is where Jeff made something that was very cool because there is no outside box. Um, it is just two sticks that slide against each other. And every other pinch rod has these boxes that wrap around. I mean, this just makes it very, very easy to make, but it's traditional. I want something that just looks cool. And the idea with a sliding dovetail is it's going to take a lot of work. And so in this case, I can loosen up this knob and I can slide it in and out without showing the box that's around it. It's a very, very cool, elegant design. It's going to be very hard to make, and that's one of the things that I liked about it. It was a big, big challenge to make this, and that's why we had to go through a bunch of renditions. But the challenge and making something that was cool, making something that was ornate, and taking it from the expected standard traditional into something that is elegant and cool uh, is why I did this video. Um, and I don't think a lot of people understood that because a lot of people saw a pinch rod for the first time and they thought, wow, that's complicated and really overdone. Um, and yes, this is complicated and overdone because um, I was trying to make something different, but if you don't know what this is, then this is very complicated. Um, so that really confused a lot of people, and I'm sorry for that. I mean, you could just take two tape measures and, you know, with spring clips, lock them together, and you've got the exact same thing. Now look at that. Now I've got a pinch rod, um, and I could slide it and lock it, and, it, you know, that, why, why do I mess with this? Because it's cool. Um, and I wanted the challenge, and so that's why this came out, um, which was a little surprising. I, 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 I kind of expected people to naturally make that jump, and I shouldn't have because if you don't know the history of pinch rods and what this is, you don't understand why I wanted to make something like this. Uh, the other question that came out a lot is why are these, um, if you look at this, this point is down here, and this point is up here, and the idea of them not being coplanar uh, really scared a lot of people. And it really doesn't matter that they are coplanar or not. Um, the distance is from this point to this point, and having them coplanar is not going to change the measurement at all. Um, you're measuring from point to point. Um, and then on top of that, the really cool thing that Jeff added was being able to put the washers on the end and being able to measure out drawer slots. So having the built-in tolerances for your drawer slot so you can be measuring not only the opening that the drawer needs to fit into, but then the measurement of the, the outside diameter of the drawer. That's absolutely fascinating. And when I make drawers, that is something I'm going to be using every single time now because that is just really, really cool. Um, and until you've done it a few times and actually used pinch rods to make measurements like that, you don't quite understand how valuable that is. And so I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, so if anyone has particular questions. What was it? There was one on there that was earlier. Yeah, Warren had one up earlier. What's uh, that? Warren said, earlier, early question on the pinch rod you built during this week. With all the hassle you went through building the rod at that size, would it have been easier to increase the dimensions? Um, no, and that's one of the things that made this really cool is that the idea is I want to make it as small and as compact as possible. Um, and so yes, you could make it bigger but then if you're gonna make it bigger, just make traditional pinch rods. Um, and these are just, they're easier and simpler, and there's lots of easier ways to make it. Um, the idea isn't to make something easy, the idea is to make something cool. And a lot of times, making it smaller, um, putting the pieces together and hiding the joinery 
makes it more challenging. It will make it more difficult to make, but in the end, you get a more elegant piece. And uh, I think that was the, the big downside is a lot of people didn't quite see that I was trying to make something that was more elegant, which, um, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, there, there is a, a very serious reason why pinch rods can be found in every antique toolbox. Um, a lot of uh, the big tool chests actually have slots that are designed for the pinch rods to fit into, or even a full set of pinch rods for different lengths, um, because they were an incredibly valuable measuring tool, um, especially when you're not in the mindset of standard measurements. Oh, here, let me show you this one. Um, so let me, this one, um, I'm going to have a video coming out, probably not this week, but next week on making this set. Um, because from Jeff from Reed Plains, um, he had the, the kit for making this one, um, which confused a lot of people. But he's also making this kit as well, which actually has uh, you know, hardware pieces. Um, and so this one will be um, coming available. But then he also made this, which is modern pinch rods. Uh, this one is really kind of cool because now I can do the same thing. It gets right into the corner and I can get an exact measurement very easily from corner to corner. Or I have the slot on here. I can easily go from outside to outside and it holds on the way you would expect with a pinch rod to. Um, so, yeah, tape measure pinch rod. <laughs> Did we have any other uh, questions? Mm -mm. No, we have any questions yet? Oh, wow, this is a quiet group tonight. I think um, they're all listening. Oh, yeah. Scary. Now, the, the whole <laughs> idea of um, standardized measurements is a very fascinating one to me. Uh, this one's a little more difficult to put together because I have to pop these in. Oh, that's right. i got to work from this end. Um, it, it's one of those things that we kind of lost when we moved to power tools. And you don't naturally see a direct connection between the two. But... Um, when you move to power tools, the other thing that we moved is factory work, is the um, being able to make a hundred things that are exactly the same. And if you want to make a hundred things that are exactly the same, you have to have a standard measurement that can transfer from one maker to the next. Um, and so that was one of the things that also went along with the, the whole power tool transition. What was that? So J.S. Chucking and Guitars asked, did you see that wooden hand plane video yet? That wooden hand plane video. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know which one you're talking about. Throw uh, another comment in there and I'll respond. Um, I've seen a lot of wooden hand plane videos. <laughs> um, now I just flipped off. Uh, do you have a mom joke line? I do. Oh, good. What you got? It's more of a pun, but anyways, I like puns. James told me to stop acting like a flamingo. I had to put my foot down. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah, you do look like a flamingo. Leggy and pink. Leggy. That's the first time I've ever been called leggy <laughs> in my life. Okay, um... I have no, a question if off. you need help getting back on track. Yeah, it would throw me the question and I'll jump back on them. Um, Dennis Miko asks, where do you buy the reed kits? Where do you buy what? The reed kits. Um, on my website. Actually, I think I put a link to it in the description down below, but if you go to woodbyright.com, um, he is currently selling all the reed products through my website because I have a website set up for it, so I'm letting him use it. Um, hopefully, we'll soon be having a reed system. Um, and a lot of people have been asking me about um, the the relationship with Reed Plains. Um, I am selling all of the products for him um, and helping him with the distribution. Um, I don't make, I, I do make some, but I don't make that much on it. Um, my big thing for it is I'm really, really wanting uh, Jeff to get back into making hand planes uh, because he ma made hand planes back in the 80s and they were... Yeah, really, really good hand planes. There's only been a few that have been resold, and then they have, they have been um, very pricey. They are really, really nice hand planes, um, and I'm wanting him to get back into that. And so hopefully soon we're going to actually start seeing the first uh, reed plane block plane, uh, which I'm really getting excited about. Um, so those might be coming here soon. But part of that is uh, he's, he has 
he's kind of like a, a crazy inventor, always coming up with really, really cool ideas. So we have you know, the pinch rods, and I'm currently working on a marking gauge with four different beams that can also be used as a scratch stock, um, and a bunch of other things that he's coming up with. And I'm, I'm really loving um, helping him out with that. I'm really looking forward to getting reed planes up and going again. Sorry. What do you say? Um, so for clarification on the wooden hand plane, um, JS Trucking says the entire plane was wood, even the frog. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I saw that one. So um, thoughts. Uh, it was a cool build. Um, it was a very cool build. I haven't, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, let me give everyone another, uh, else context. Um, you know, you have the, the traditional wooden plane, um, which I don't have any right here right now, um, which is all wood except for the iron. And you have a wedge that holds it in, and it's just a wooden body and a wedge and a wooden tote and an iron. Um, but he actually made a Bailey-style plane out of all wood. So wooden sides, wooden sole, wooden frog, wooden lever cap. Um, everything on it was wood, but shaped to look like a, uh, um, a Stanley Bailey. It was a really cool uh, design. Uh, I don't think it would be a good long-term plane because there isn't a whole lot of sole on it. You'd wear through it pretty quickly. But it was a very functional, um, cool experiment. Now, kind of like this. It, you know, it isn't a necessarily great tool. However, um, it is very, very cool and uh, a good chance to experiment and try something new. But yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I, mean, I guess you can't throw a link in there. But yeah, I'll have to show that off sometime. That would be, he would be a great one to have on for an uh, 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 interview. i have to look him up. What was the other? Paul Allen says, yeah, yeah, pinch stick joke time. <laughs> 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 you ready? What? My goldfish are named Major, Minor, Dorian, Lydian, and Diminished. The only way I can tell them apart are by their scales. <laughs> I like that one. That's a good one. I like it. I had to throw a music one in there. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. What was the other question in there? And that was the clarification. Oh, oh the, the entire plane frog, yes. Yes. Uh, it was a very cool video. I'll have to uh, I'll put a link on there sometime. Do you have another question? Um. Yes. Give me one second. Brandon Mabry. So with your projects going forward... Instead of plans with measurements, are you just going to ship us the story stick you used to make it? <laughs> Actually, I thought about doing that. Um, that, that would be a, a fun one to do. It would be, uh, be really cool. <laughs> yeah, because like, when, when I design, um, like my coffee table right now, not coffee table, my, my end table, uh, which you haven't seen. If you go to my Instagram page, I just put up a picture of the top, and it is just like mind-blowingly gorgeous. Um, one of the, my favorite pieces of of quarter sawn white oak ever. It's just, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's happy. Reminds me of my wife. Aw, good save. <laughs> um, but so when I measured that, I literally went upstairs with a stick. Uh, um, excuse me. I don't know if I have it here. Oh, yes, I do. Maybe I can hear. So I went upstairs with a stick, and I've got a mark here, and I've got a mark here. And I said, I want it to be this wide, and I want it to be that long and I brought this stick downstairs and I found a board and I marked it and I marked it and I cut them out and then I realized stink I got to make plans for this so then <sighs> oh it's 18 inches by 27 inches <laughs> and so then I then I went to sketch up and, and drew it out with those measurements and so I, in order to take the measurements to sketch up, I had to use standard measurements. I couldn't take my story stick and, and measure it. Um, but when I made Sarah's dresser, um, that I didn't use any measurements at all. That was completely reality sticks. I measured it between a door frame and a door to be open, able to open and close. We ended up moving the dresser to a different place, but I measured it for that slot with a stick. And I made the whole dresser without using a tape measure. Um, I, I didn't actually use standard measurements anywhere on the dresser, but then in the end I needed to make plans, and so then I brought up a tape measure and actually measured out the dresser. 
<laughs> so that I could duplicate it for uh, designs. Um, because yeah, when I, when I make something, I'll start with the general dimensions. How big does it need to be in this space? And once I have that, then I can start designing everything else in it. So I know that it's going to be this long by that wide, and I want to have four drawers in this long. Well, okay, half of that and half of that. Okay, the drawers are this long. Um, and so everything kind of flows from that standard measurement, um, or that unstandard measurement. But, uh, yeah. Is that another one? Yes. Um, so JS Trucking Guitar says, is there another collab video coming? I saw the post meet, <laughs> meet up with uh, Rex. Um, no, not this trip. I, um, we, were, we were looking at doing something, but I just didn't have enough time. I, I drove out to, uh, to Ohio. I left at 1 a.m. I got there at noon. I shot video all day long, got to the hotel, um, and then the next day I drove um, an hour and a half up to Rex. We had lunch. And I spent the rest of the day driving back home. Um, so we didn't have enough time to shoot anything. But uh, yeah, we've, we, uh, Rex and I have done a few long distance collabs. We haven't done anything together. Um, we want to, but uh, every time we try to do it, something has come together. We, yeah, we were talking, there was like six times that the two of us have tried to get together and uh, it has fallen apart every time. <laughs> so we, we finally at least said hi. <laughs> oh, and I gotta show you this. Um, so. If you are one of Rex's patrons, um, he just released this new tool, uh, which is a, oh. a keychain tool. Backup, it's not. Not in focus? Mm -mm. Um, and so it's got a split nut driver, um, 25 degree angle finder, flat blade. Uh, there's like six different tools on this that it can do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so as a patron, I bought one and uh, I'm still waiting for it to come. But when I was at his house, he said, oh, I got something special for you. And the, the first 200 for patrons are, um, are actually marked out with one of 200, two of 200, and he gave me number one. Aww. So, yeah, so if you're he patron, you can buy one didn't of those have to pay shipping. <laughs> but uh, if you're not, you gotta wait another week or so, but you don't get the ones that are numbered, so. So yeah, I've got another one coming from him, so I'll have two of them. I'll save that one nice, and then I'll put the other one on the keychain. <laughs> What's next? You're blowing up Rex's announcer. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, I'm seeing if there's any specifically on topic. I think we're some are a little bit more random than others. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the blessed use of my sneeze. Dwayne <laughs> Rowan? asked, what measuring tools do they use in the workshops in historic Williamsburg? Um, usually just pinch rod story sticks. Um, they, these didn't exist back then. Um, you would use pinch rods and story sticks. You, you really don't, don't need anything more than that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. One of the other interesting things when I was there is um, we think of, you know, you can never have enough clamps, and I've got clamps and clamps and clamps and clamps and more clamps and more clamps and more clamps, and every shop now has thousands of clamps, and you go there, and he, they have um, six communal clamps that they all use. It's like six clamps total for the shop. And, you know, in reality, um, traditionally, you didn't use a lot of clamps. Either you use a rubbed joint, um, or you would actually put a layup jig on your bench and use a couple wedges and lock it together with that. Um, and so there were a lot of things like that that were just very different that we think are just mandatory. You've got to have clamps and I just didn't use a lot of clamps back then. Um, and if you look at a lot of the inventories from shops back at that time, they, they didn't have a lot of clamps. Um, same thing with measuring. Uh, measuring tapes are, they were like turn of the last century that they started coming out. Um, folding rules were a little before that, um, but you know, pre-Civil War, it was measuring sticks and story sticks, um, uh, uh, pinch rods and story sticks, um, and you can do all your measurement with that. So, <laughs> what's next? Another one? Yeah, it's JS Trucking says story stick. How many did you read? How many do I read? The story or do you thing. need? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's supposed to be needed, but I was figuring it was a pun. <laughs> yes. No. Whenever I, whenever I try, whenever I need to make 
standard measurements for a lot of different things. Um, either, number one, I'll try and get all the pieces together. Like when I did the legs, I have four legs, and I need marks for the bottom um, stretcher to be at the same level on all of them. And so it's easier to put all the legs next to each other, put a square on it, and mark them all at once. And that way I know the mark is the same on all of them. But if I can't put them all together, I'm going to make a story stick, and I'm going to mark that. And I'm going to use the story stick to mark them all. Um, that is so much more accurate than using a tape measure. Uh, because your measurement is, you know, how accurate are your lines on this? If they're the 16th of an inch, you're going to be within a 16th of an inch. Um, and if I want something more accurate, story stick. It is incredibly accurate. It's a one-off thing. When it's done with it, you throw it in the burn pile. But uh, every shop has a pile of sticks, and it's a great way to use them. What's next? Let's see. We're going to go slightly off topic now. So Ward Wilson asked, um, totally off topic, and you may have answered it many times before, but what is the blue on the planes behind you? Um, these ones back here, um, if they are blue, they are planes that I have completely restored for my own use. Um, well, I mean, these have all been restored from one level or another. But if they're blue, that means at one point um, they looked something like this. Um, they were out of focus. They, they, they looked like trash. Um, and so usually when they get to this stage and the sole starts looking like this and the, the Japan, Japaning isn't on there very well, um, I'm going to sandblast them. I'm going to fully take them down. And if I take something down to bare metal, I'm going to repaint it with my blue. Um, so in any of the tools I have, like my, my Barnes um, number 5 lathe, um, is also painted blue and out of focus. There we go. So what you can see of it is painted blue um, because I fully restored that. Um, so if I strip something down to metal, I will paint it blue because I like the color. Um, I actually do not own any um, record planes, which are also painted blue, a slightly different blue color. Um, I just like the look of blue. Blue makes me happy. Blue! Much to my wife's confusion and, and I'm not No, confusion. the color blue doesn't confuse me. I just confuse you in general. <laughs> I'm so used to you by now. <laughs> if they're black, it means that I restored them, but I didn't have to do much more than clean them up and remove a little bit of rust. If they're blue, they had to be fully stripped down. Um, so, yeah, that's where blue planes came from. What's next? Let's see. Mark Baldwin asks, I recently bought a Stanley number 50 plane. For some reason, the small cutters are too thin, 3 16th, um, and the plane won't hold them. Am I missing a part or doing something wrong? Um, can you read the first half of that again? It's a Stanley 50 plane, uh -huh. and the, cutter, the small cutters are too thin, and the plane won't hold them. Small cutters are too thin. Um, are you saying across the iron or in the thickness of the blade? Um, the reason being, uh, I'm assuming, oops, let me pull that down so you can actually. I broke my camera. Not quite, but it's grabbing the wrong thing. So, oh shoot, I pushed a button. You give me a second here. Thousand one. Yes. There we go. Let's flip over to three. So uh, what we have here is something that's out of focus is an iron um, in here. And if this iron gets thinner this way, then eventually this skate is going to run into this skate. And so in this particular one, the thinnest iron I can put in there is a quarter inch. Um, and so if I need something smaller than a quarter inch, uh, this won't do it. So I'm assuming that's what you're saying. Um, because you can get eighth inch irons, um, but those only work in the Stanley 45 or the 55 due to how they grab. Um, so I'm assuming that's what you're saying. If you're saying that the thickness of the steel, the plate is, is too thin, which it should be an eighth inch, so if it's like a sixteenth inch, then that cutter is from something else. Um, 
So I hope that answers your question. Yes, this can't do anything less than a quarter inch in, wide, in width. What's next? Or if he throws up a clarification, let me know. I will certainly throw it at you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, James Carey asked, <clears throat> have you seen the bronze knob from Reed Tools that Chester Spire was trying? Yes, yes. Um, that's, uh, he's actually, uh, he sent that knob back to Reed and Jeff is going to be sending it to me um, to play with. So yes, uh, I believe, I believe Jeff has just sent those off to the foundry to produce a few of them. Um, they're going to be fairly expensive because it is a big chunk of bronze. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, um, he actually, the front knob on the plane, um, he cast bronze knobs. So you can replace this whole thing with a big, beefy bronze knob. And it puts a lot of weight on the plane. Um, which is one of those things that some people really will like and some people really won't. Um, but it gives a whole different feel to the plane because it, and if you put that on like a number four, it's going to almost double the weight of the plane. Um, it, it makes a really beefy, heavy feel to the plane. And if you like that, then uh, stay tuned. Those might be coming out soon. So you can just make it a like a workout machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Increase your weights as you. <laughs> oh, and we did get clarification. It was across the width, Mark said. Okay. Yeah. Then if it's less than a quarter inch, um, it's probably an iron that came from a 45 or a 55. It doesn't fit in the 50. As a 55 can't do anything smaller than a quarter inch. Uh, let's see. Warren Munn. A couple months ago, you did a video on making some jigs and asked for ideas. I'd love to see how to make a miter box due to my inability to cut straight due to disability. <laughs> well, making a miter box, you have to at least cut straight once. Um, but to be honest, if, if you're making a miter box, it will not improve how straight you can cut. It may improve it for one or two cuts, but eventually you're going to start to wear out that miter box and it's not going to give you a straight cut anymore. Um, a miter box won't fix bad body mechanics. Um, it will just continue because the body mechanics will then destroy the miter box. Um, so yeah, there's a reason that miter boxes are, actually they came about the same time that standard measuring tools and power tools came about. Um, miter boxes were, were something that were um, not very common. Um, and I almost, I have two of them, I never use them. Unless I need to do a really crazy weird compound cut and I don't want to take the time to mark it out. In that case it can save me a little bit of time and function. Um, but most of the time, it's just not um, not a tool I would bring into the shop. Um, it, it, you'll spend better time improving your body mechanics. Um, yes, it will take time, but it's a skill. It's one of those things that everyone can learn it. It's just going to take some people a little more time than others. I know, not the thing you want to hear. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, if you're making a wooden miter box, it won't it won't correct stray cuts. Um, if, you're, if your body mechanic isn't right, you're going to destroy the miter box and it's not going to give you what you want. What's next? Uh, Walnut Woodworker asks, would, what would you do with a plane that has a chip out of the check in the back? A chip out of the check? That's what it says. Oh, the cheek. Cheek. Ah, it's missed. Um, I've got quite a few that have chips out of the cheek. Well, I I know I have at least one. Um, oh, come on. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Thought I did. I may have slowly cycled them out. But yeah, I've had several where there has been a, uh, you know, a missing chunk out of the cheek or like this, the top section's broken off or there'd be a chip out of here. Uh, as long as you have a, a decent continuation from one side to the other, just leave it alone. Um, I mean, some of them you can do some with. Like this one I have a, a chip out of back here. Um, now this one I actually broke a chunk off of the toe. 
And yeah, I don't know if you can actually see that crack anymore, but I did JB weld and actually just re-glued this corner on. So this whole corner broke off and I just glued it back in place. Um, but just a, a chunk out of the cheek isn't going to cause much of a problem. Now, if you have a plane that's missing the cheek, like this one, then yeah, you're going to have problems. Um, <laughs> this you one's, have a few other this one's beyond a reporter's <laughs> store, but yeah, if you're missing the cheek, uh, it's going to be too flexible and you're going to have other issues with it. What's next? Uh, Ken Carlisle asked, have you worked with wormy chestnut and if so, any gotchas to be aware of? Um, I've only worked with chestnut once. It was a very pleasing wood to work with. Um, I work with a lot of wormy woods. I like um, wormholes. The, the problem with them is, is if you're going to fill them, they are a pain because they continually soak up more glue and then you put more glue down there and they, um, then you get these bubbles and when you actually do your final smoothing, you actually cut through the top of the bubble and you've got this little cavity that suddenly pops up and, and uh, um, they are, they're, they're a pain to work with. Um, if you're going to fill them, just understand it is going to take you a crazy amount of time and you're going to have to do it six, seven, eight coats to actually get them done right. Um, or more to actually fill all the holes. Um, if you're not going to fill them, then yeah, they're really, really nice to use because <laughs> the, the holes do not affect the, the work and the functioning of it. But uh, yeah, good stuff. What's that? Um, that is from JS Trucking and Guitars. Have you seen anyone use a half lap dovetail 45 degree butt joint on drawer corner joints? A half Half lap dovetail, 45 degree butt joint. Half lap dovetail, 45 degree butt joint. I do not know what you're meaning by that. So no, I don't think I've seen that. Because <laughs> um, if it's a butt joint, it's not a dovetail joint. Uh, if it's a half lap, it's not a dovetail. And if it's a half lap, it's not a butt joint. Um, you could have any one of those 45 degrees, but I don't know how you would mix those together. Send me a picture, I'd be interested. <laughs> I've made all of those individually, um, but uh, not as one big thing. So, Warren followed up with the question about the miter box and inability to cut straight. So, clarification, was thinking of running brass or aluminum inserts for the inside of the slots. Muscle memory doesn't work when your hands shake involuntarily. Oh, yeah, then you're running into, yeah. Um, if you're going to do that, honestly, the best thing to do would be to actually go buy a miter box. Um, you can, you can actually regularly find a good old style Stanley miter box for around 25 to 40 bucks. Um, and those, those will work well because rather than holding onto the plate of the saw, they hold onto the back of the saw. And so they actually ride, um, and so there's a, the box holds the top here, and so it rides on the back rather than riding on the plate. Um, because anything that rubs up against the side of the plate is going to get worn away by the teeth. Um, even brass and aluminum, they will last longer than general wood, um, but they will wear out a lot faster. Um, they, they, they will wear out. Um, so, yeah, if, if you really want to get into it, then get a, a, get a good antique miter box. Um, it will save you so much trouble. Um, and if you really want one, I have two of them up in my garage. Um, so if you're anywhere near Rockford or want to pay for the shipping, uh, let me know and I'll get one out to you. Send me an email. What's next? Uh, hang on, I'm just making sure I've caught up with what's... So then Alan S. said, asked if it's a half-blind dovetail that's mitered at the top, if that's what they're trying to explain. Ah, yeah, a half-blind dovetail or a full-blind dovetail, 
Yes, I've done both of those. Um, a miter, um, you can get a, uh, with the dovetail comes together and so it interlocks, but then the top, rather than having either a pin or a tail on it, the top section mm -hmm. is mitered 45 degrees. So when you look at it from the top, you see that um, it is, you see the 45 miter joint. But um, you can actually get a full blind dovetail, which is mitered on the top, the outside corner, and the bottom. And then inside, you actually have the dovetails that lock it together. And so you don't see the dovetails at all from any direction. Whereas a half blind, you don't see the dovetails from the front, but you can still see it from the side. Okay. Um, I'm using all three joints in a single joint. A half lap dovetail. Yeah, so you're thinking a half blind with a mitered uh, corner on it. Um, so a, a half blind, um, uh, I don't think I have one around here. A half blind is the traditional way to do dovetails on the front of a drawer. But then if you do a mitered half blind, the top um, pin corner actually gets mitered so you don't see it. Um, if you want a full blind, then you don't see the dovetails at all and it just looks like a mitered joint. Um, a butt joint has no angle. A butt joint is one board running into the other. Um, whereas a mitered joint, both of them are mitered and put together. So I hope that answers your question. Um, so, but have I done one? I have. I don't remember what project. I think I was making a box. That sounds like a really good live. I should do that sometime. Mitered dovetails. Haven't you done one? What's that? You haven't done one live? I probably have. I was, like <laughs> I was counting it, and I'm, I'm coming up on 2,500 videos between the two channels. I um, feel like we've done that. <laughs> I've done a lot of videos that I don't even remember. <laughs> but maybe I should do that and make another good live. Yeah, Mitre, do Mitre dovetails, those are fun. Yes, the full blind. That's what he said. Oh, full blind. Oh, um, I've only done full blind once. Full blind are a pain. Um, one of the best videos I've seen out though is actually um, Wooden Shop. Um, it did a video at uh, in Williamsburg, um, and the guys in Williamsburg actually demonstrated it and he videoed it. Really, really cool video. Um, but yes, they did the the full blind dovetail. Um, that would make a good live. Actually, there are probably about two lives to actually demonstrate it because there is a lot of work on that. It is it's not an easy joint to make. It's a it's a very intensive, a lot of weird marks. Um, but very worth it. It's, it's a very, very cool joint. What's next? Warren says, let them know the shipping to Australia for that miter box. Yeah, let me know. Um, that would not be cheap, but we can do it. Yeah. Send me an email. I have to break it down for you to get in a little smaller box. I think we've caught up. Really? The questions. Well, I think we can wrap this one up. Um, next week will be the uh, monthly Q&A. And then the one after that, we might be doing a full blind dovetail. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so uh, I think we'll wrap it up unless I got anything else I'm missing. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.